500 years ago, Magellan set sail from Spain on what would become the first circumnavigation of the Earth. 50 years ago, the Apollo 11 crew set sail on humanity's first voyage to the moon, breaking the boundaries of what was previously thought possible. Today, our intrepid team of aviators and astronauts will attempt to fly around the Earth faster than anyone ever has in an effort to set the pole-to-pole -pole circumnavigation world record. We started planning about five years ago, and wow. uh, it's been evolving ever since. So this record that was your idea, describe the record real quick. It's two, really. It's an average speed record, which is the FAI international record, and the Guinness Book, which we're also going for, is a, uh -huh. is a pure time record. OK. It's the so fastest it's time ever to go from one place on the Earth over both poles and back to the same point on the Earth, all in under 48 hours. The original idea was to celebrate the Apollo 11 landings. Um, so the, the actual landing, which is now 50th anniversary, coming up in July 2019, in a few weeks' time. And um, we're going to go out at the Kennedy Space Center. So just here in Florida, NASA's been very helpful. We'll be going out of the shuttle landing right. runway, which you know well, That's having <laughs> landed your shuttle there. Over the top, we have to go via the North Pole. This okay. is a round-the-world speed record. Over the North Pole, turn right and down to Astana, first refuel Astana. Then down to Mauritius, second refuel in Mauritius. Looks like a long route, but that's actually the shortest of the four sectors. We go from Mauritius due south to the South Pole, turn right at the South Pole, and up to Chile, Punta right. Arenas, where we do the last of the three refuels. From there, we go due north, all the way back to the point we started, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Okay, so for this record, we have to fly directly over the North Pole, fly to the other side of the Earth, at least 120 degrees away from our takeoff point, cross directly over the South Pole, and then land at the same airfield that we took off from, all in under 48 hours. All in under 48 hours. One of the problems with being an astronaut is that your bucket list gets too long, and there are so many beautiful places on the planet that you want to see. I flew around the Earth more than 3,000 times while in space, but I never saw the North Pole or South Pole because our orbit doesn't go there. An orbit in space only takes 90 minutes, but on this airplane, it's going to take 48 hours. I'll be flying a lot slower, and I'll be much closer to the planet. This is a challenging route. It obviously goes to the parts of the world, the North and South Pole, right. which are pretty remote, and we want to do that as quickly as we can. So looking at things such as the weather on this route, not just terrestrial, but also space weather as we go over the top of the North Pole. So there are airliners over the North Pole. We fly here from Qatar to places like uh, Los Angeles, and we will go pretty much directly over but the North Pole. The flying over the South Pole, though, Different ball game. Very, very. There's rare. not a lot of airplanes down there. The time we've done it to celebrate the Apollo 11 landing is, of course, uh, midwinter in Antarctica. It's 24 hour darkness to uh, Antarctica. If we did have to divert, we're not going to be landing in Antarctica. If you did end up landing at Amundsen Scott at the South Pole, you're probably not taking off again. I would get. I mean, the airplane's uh, going to freeze. 
this world record. It's been held by three different parties. Originally a 707, okay. then a 747, and then in 2008, the record was taken by a Bombardier Global. Okay. And we're going to attempt to take the record in 2019 right. with uh, a Gulfstream G650. Max speed on this aircraft is Mach 925. It's the fastest business jet in the world. Wow. That is 92% um, of, of the speed of sound. You know, the G650ER, one of the latest airplanes, it's, it's got some pretty uh, impressive kit on board. Some very clever people have designed it. The Gulfstream is really the airplane that can make it, right? It's very fast. We're going to break this up into four sectors because we need to stop for fuel. The real challenge is making sure the refuels work very, very quickly. The pit you, stops. You could lose a huge amount of time if your right. refuel was too slow. So the refuelers have to be there ready for a, a Formula One type pit stop refuel. No airliners can be blocking the way and we launch immediately, no delay. So we have two crews, four pilots really, yep. and the one flight attendant to yep. keep the cabin safe. For the passengers, the poor film crew in the back of this airplane, um, it's like four trips, Los Angeles to London. It's, it's a nice airplane, yeah. but it's 48 hours. It is. Um, you know, you're going to be in a seat. There's some good news. We're going to feed you. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to give us fish and spicy. We're not going to give you fish. We're not going to give you spicy food because, again, we don't want There's any problems. No getting sick. Especially, especially over that, over the Southern Pole. Of course, we give you high quality food like we, we, we do always. The pilot's going to be eating the same thing. Are you guys all going to have the fish for dinner? Oh, no. Uh, we'll always split it so the pilots are eating different food. Different things. Just in case there was a problem with that is one not a bad dish. idea. Yeah. Yeah. I still get goosebumps thinking about, you know, how you know the human race. Obviously, Americans led it, but I think the human race managed, you know, 50 years ago to put that man or those men on the moon. It was really one of the only times in history where all of humanity was kind of united. He didn't say, you know, one small step for an American or one right. small step for. He said one small step for man. You know, that really, I think, brought everyone together. You can have an aircraft from Qatar. You can have a commander from Denmark. You can have, you know, guys from the U.S. on board. Yeah. You have the U.K. The other pilots from South Africa, Ukraine. The flight attendants going to be from Poland, Norway. Norway, yeah. You're talking about yeah. passengers from Germany, yeah. And my Russian cosmonaut friends. So you can have no two guys on board with the same nationality, and they come from all over the world. That's amazing. We're going to have ten people, plus or minus, and nobody's from the same country. That's Correct. pretty impressive. It's yeah. more international than the International Space Station. Yeah, really. I really consider that. But yeah. On board, we have four pilots, all Gulfstream G650 qualified, a flight attendant, Magdalena, to keep the crew safe, and Ben, a G650 flight engineer. We also have Janneke, who's in charge of our live stream and satellite operations. And then there's me and Gennady, who we're picking up at our first refuel stop in Kazakhstan. So who is the flight director here? Is it that'll you? be myself. That'll yeah. be you, okay. Yeah, that'll be myself. So you're updating the pilots on diverts? Correct. And of course, that's on board. The flight computer. You'll have that on board. But, yeah. but, but what we will do is we'll be talking to those divers. So we'll be monitoring you, making sure that age space, you, you never get to a point where you don't have an option. Yes. So this is a map which is showing our road. These routes can be flown as direct from North Pole, Nopal, to Astana, but that route we are still coordinating with the Russian CIA Russian to, ATC. Approve, ATC yeah. to approve direct route, right. and then followed by Astana to Mauritius. Okay. This is the route we are following, and it's going to be 9 hours, 14 minutes of the trip time. Okay. And then the next flight plan is, is this is the one quite challenging flight plan yeah. from Mauritius to Punta Arenas on the South Pole side. Right. That's a tough leg. And this is quite a, again, easy leg. So it's only it's, how uh, long? It's only 10 hours, 16 minutes, <laughs> and Mach 90, and it's a, it's a good flight, actually, from right. Pantanaras to a shuttle facility. So we're taking off with a full load of gas? Full, yes. So we will have this fuel on landing. 2083? 2083. And okay. then uh, contingency also will be with you. So we'll land with 2,000 pounds? Yes. So we'll take yes. off with 46,000 pounds and yes. land with two? Yes. Land with 4% of our... 4% of your... Uh, original takeoff fuel. Take oh, fuel. Yes. Wow. So you literally, you do all this, yes. and the pilots don't do anything. Where were you during my 30 years as an Air Force <laughs> pilot? <laughs> as part of our mission preparation, we brought our jet to the Gulfstream headquarters in Savannah, Georgia, 
to undergo essential maintenance as well as set up everything needed for the Wi-Fi network and filming equipment. We also started weighing every piece of gear to make sure we meet the requirements for the world record. Setting the live stream system required an army of people across three different continents. It took us a week to direct the spots in the satellite onto our predicted flight path. And then it took us another four days to wire the aircraft to handle the imaging for the live stream. We had to use these tiny small cameras because of the weight restriction. How many additional consumers? We had to stretch cable from the flight deck all the way back to the cargo at the back of the aircraft. What we were achieving was something that has never been achieved before. This mission is challenging technology to the max. This wasn't a guaranteed safe flight. The biggest risk was crossing the South Pole where we wouldn't be able to diverge. Is this mission so important to me that I am happy to risk my life? And I'm such a tech nerd that yes, <laughs> yes it is. Here you go, you're airborne. The testing has begun. We only had one chance to test our live stream system during the flight from Savannah to the Kennedy Space Center, the day before launch. Thank you very much, everyone, and welcome to one more of it. It's going to be a very, very interesting project we're going to do here, a very, very long flight, two uh, long days. So we have created a rest schedule. We will hand that out to everyone tomorrow. We will have the rest at least three and a half hours per break. So on the two short sectors, we'll have three, three and a half hours, everyone, and on the two long sectors, we'll have four and a half hours, everyone. So again, the time that you're looking at arrival is 8.22, is what I heard? That, that's what we're looking at, but I mean, that's four legs, you know, there's a lot of... And we've gone, I understand that, but yeah. you will come in. You'll be too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to get a token. To honor the Apollo 11 mission, one more orbit will take off at exactly 9.32 a.m. Eastern Time, the same as the Apollo 11 launch 50 years ago. Well, we're going to try and fly fast. Um, I know. 
Conference 13 and you give us an update. Uh, I'll be interested in when they get clearance. We now need to start clearing the cabin, please. All personnel who are not coming on holiday to Kazakhstan need to leave. Doors closing in five minutes. It's journey 47 hours. That's appreciated. Thank you. for their efforts in uh, getting everyone on time. Yes. Well Just another 48 hours minus a little bit. Alright, <laughs> <laughs> Terry, what do you think? We're airborne. Yep. This is awesome. We launched out of the Kennedy Space Station. The last time I launched out of here, yeah. it was a little bit more G's yeah. and noise. My name is uh, Terry Vert Sr. Terry is my son. I worked in a space program myself in flight operations in the control center, flight ops. And I used to take him into work on the weekends when he was, you know, he was just a couple years old. He was interested from the beginning. He's got pictures on his wall of airplanes, and rockets. We are there to launch. It was exciting. It was a nighttime launch. It was like five o'clock in the morning. And you get the rumble of the engine starting up and uh, the whole sky lit up. It was exciting, but then you knew your son was up the top of there, you know? So you're kind of holding your breath until you get up in orbit, you know? I'm Giles Harding, son of Hamish Harding. Hamish is a daredevil. He's not careless, but he loves the excitement. He, he just loves the feeling. He's really... Uh, adventurous and he'll he he's a good dad I want to be a rugby player but if I can't then I'd love to do what my dad does take over his company or I could be a pilot and yeah that's kind of my life dream really Eric Spoil, congratulations on your on-time departure from everyone here. If I can ask for the fuel contents and time at Bravo Kilo Whiskey Magellan didn't have it this good. No, I bet they didn't. <laughs> Tell Terry about the countdown. So we linked up the uh, the, the phone to a, to a GPS clock. We were lined up on the runway at about uh, 0, 0, 09, 30 and about 30 seconds. Right. We had the, the, the power set and then we started the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7. So at exactly 25 seconds before 9.32, Break release. we released the brakes. I heard you count down. You yeah, can do your ten. countdown. You can do your countdown. Eight. And then whilst we were rolling, I started the countdown to 9:32, and we had about um, about three or four seconds to go when we when we reached V1. So we just <laughs> kept it on the ground just for a couple of seconds, and then rotated. Can you hear us uh, we were, accelerating? I, we, yeah. I could. I could hear the screams from coming from the back. It was fantastic. <laughs> on the fourth leg, we're not going to be screaming again. We're going to be like, oh my God, just take it over. Yeah. yeah. Thank goodness, one to go. <laughs> 
Yeah. That's staffing, okay? So 16, 12. They're waiting at us. They're just having dinner. <laughs> 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 I'll tell Jerry they're waving back. As I looked down on the cracked ice of the Canadian Arctic, I couldn't help but think about the effects of climate change on this region and the rest of the world. People always say, you know, when you were in space, could you see climate change? And of course you can't, you can't see change. You need an Excel spreadsheet with 50 years of data in order to see it. Um, but you could see pollution, especially over China and, and even India, just giant brown smog. And you can see deforestation in the Amazon. And Madagascar was like just this brown rock with a little green strip in the east. Really? The whole island was a rainforest, and they deforested about 90% of it. Wow. wow. It'll take centuries to recover. You know, uh, I used to live down south in Germany. Yeah. Um, and you can really see over the, like the, f the past three, four decades, the, the reduction in the glaciers. Yeah. They're massively shrinking. Yeah. It's actually pretty warm up here. It's minus 42. It should be minus 56 on the standard ISIS scale. One more orbit is a new type of exploration. Our team knew we had to counteract the environmental impact of this mission. So we teamed up with the Carbon Underground, an organization working towards a solution to reduce carbon in the atmosphere by restoring our soil and ecosystem. You can see that there's a problem that needs to be solved. How do you guys help with that problem of climate change? Well, let's start with our name, Carbon, carbon underground. underground. The Carbon Underground. Our, our entire mission is to take carbon the legacy carbon up in the atmosphere that we've put up there over the last really 100, 150 years at scale, and take that carbon and put it back in the ground where it came from. Throughout the Earth's history, we've had 15 times as much carbon right. in the atmosphere as we have now that's right. causing problems. Right. And every time, nature was able to deal with it. Right. How did it do it? Well, it did it by using something that we all learned about in third grade called photosynthesis, right? right? Carbon is taken by these plants and the plant takes what they want and the rest of it goes down into the soil to feed the microorganisms. Right. So every, every teaspoon of healthy soil, if it's healthy, there are about seven billion living things in it. 20,000 to 100,000 species. Think about that for a and second. And they're all hungry. They're all hungry, and you know what they want? Carbon. When you grow food, and this is really about how we grow food, when you grow food in a way that fights nature, as opposed to works with nature, and we kill that soil and we kill those microorganisms, what nature says is, well, there's nobody demanding this carbon. Right. So I'm gonna leave it up there. If you think about it, the real reason we have climate change is we have shut down nature's own tool to deal with that natural regulation by managing our soil use, not monocropping or using chemicals and not tilling the soil, we can bring down exponentially more carbon back into the ground where it belongs. To draw that legacy carbon back down while we are also reducing emissions. Right. If we only reduce emissions, it's going to be brutal quickly. One more orbit is a race against time to break this record and our climate is also a race against time. Right. 
we're doing a race to save the planet. Mm -hmm. We can quantify per acre how much carbon's gonna come down and we can literally take your mission from adding carbon to being carbon neutral to actually being carbon negative and helping reverse climate change. We can fix there, this. There's hope. Oh my gosh, I mean, we're literally right. growing hope. Okay, one more orbit. Stand by to copy space weather. You have solar ray flux flare class alpha. We have solar proton flux level one, and we have geomagnetic activity kilopapa index four. You are go for the pole with space weather. Good luck, guys. Uh, we'll aim to see you once you re-establish comms back over the other side. We're down to uh, 12 minutes to the North Pole now. North Pole, which is written as N-O-P-O-L, and uh, you will see that we've got to fly over. We fly over and then turn right by about 60 degrees. across the North Pole and uh, we didn't go over the edge. The flat earther theory does appear to be <laughs> wrong, completely wrong. I think that proves we are a sphere. This is one more orbit on 89 in position. So we've just approached the North Pole from Canada, and we're now just past the North Pole, heading south okay. to Russia. This is my first time over the pole. I haven't done either of them. Yeah. But it was just incredible to see the technology that is, that is out these days and to see how the estimated position of uncertainty widen as we literally went over the pole. And then uh, about a degree or so later, it started to tighten up again and find its position in space. How did the old guys do it? Like, imagine being here in 1950, flying over the pole. Well, a lot of people died right. near, the, near the magnetic North Pole because uh, things just didn't work right. Compasses right. didn't work, and people uh, went off track and never, never made it to land. It was a long time before they really worked out what was going on up here. Take down the following information, please. CNN would like to do an interview. Please get Terry to call ASAP. They want to do a live interview in 15 minutes from now. Calling themselves One More Orbit, their goal is to complete the fastest circumnavigation of the Earth via the North and South Poles in a business jet. Can you hear us? Good. Good and they're live streaming the whole thing. With me now, from inside that flight, somewhere near the North Pole, is former astronaut and International Space Station Commander Colonel Terry Verts. Colonel, thanks very much for being with us. Anderson, it's good to be with you. Uh, we actually just passed the North Pole about an hour ago. I don't know if you're able to turn the camera at all and kind of show where, where you are uh, in terms of the plane. Yeah. Let's take a look. 
So this is, this is uh, right now it's cloudy, but we just had some spectacular patches of no clouds and the ice was just beautiful. So how long do you expect this all to take, this flight? Well, we're hoping it takes about 47 hours in order to get the record. The Qatar executive actually owns the aircraft. And they have an amazing support staff. I figured you must have some engineer and some really good technical people even to make the Wi-Fi work, because most people can't, you know, that often breaks down on, on, on planes for most of us. I'll, I'll tell you. Right, our satellite, our MRSAT satellites are over the equator. So we were out of satellite coverage coming over the pole, and we picked up the satellite about 30 seconds before we went on air. Wow. Well, uh, we wish you the best. Colonel Terry uh, Virch, thank you so much. We'll be following you. Thanks for having us. All right, be careful up there. On our way to the first refueling stop, Russian air traffic control had given us a very indirect route. So our pilot, Yevgen, spoke to them in Russian, telling them we were on our way to pick up Gennady Padalka, a legendary Russian cosmonaut, and also a good friend of mine from our days on the International Space Station. After hearing that, our Russian air traffic control friends gave us direct routing. It seems to me humankind always look at the sky, at stars, and always dreamt to explore our universe and our solar system. The most important things that I learned and gained during my space career, I would say this is friendship. You know, when 14 countries are working together, it's, it's very great that our nations, our countries, uh, our people, our agencies, their ability to work together. It's a great example for, for, for all humankind. International cooperation is very important for all nations because we can combine our technologies. We can sustain any difficulties. We can overcome any obstacles that we got for the last 20 years. Beginning this year, 1998, men and women from 16 countries will build a foothold in the heavens. The International Space Station, with its vast expanses, scientists and engineers will actually set sail on an uncharted sea of limitless mystery and unlimited potential. And in addition, it's a great example how it can work to be example for people on the ground. I was born in the 60s. It was a very incredible and historical decade for the space exploration. And I don't remember the first flight in space, but I remember the space walk. I, I mean, our very famous cosmonaut Alexei Leonov. And of course, I remember watching the first step on the moon and Apollo 11 moon landing. And it seems to me at that time, every boy dreamed to be to be a cosmonaut, astronaut, and so did I. One more orbit, this project is very important for us because it's, it's not only attempt to beat the previous record. For me, it's, it's a great tribute and to mark Apollo 11, 50 years anniversary. And at that time, it was a very, very re remarkable event for, for not only for one nation, it seems to me for, for all humankind. As soon as we touched down for our first refuel, my heart started pounding. I was excited to see my friend Genna, but was incredibly nervous about the ground crew operations. We're running about five minutes ahead of the record, so we're still on track. It's way too early to get optimistic. We have to get through this ground stop and two more ground stops. We're 
actually going to break another world record, we hope, uh, by the time we reach the South Pole. Yeah. We should be the fastest aircraft ever to go from the North Pole to the South Pole. Right now, things are going well, but we still have three of the four lakes to go. So there's a lot of road ahead of us. Do you remember when we got ice cream on board ISS? Yes, of course. And we have, have pictures. We have a lot of ice cream, but we have no sufficient space in our refrigerator. <laughs> and Terry, because he was crew commander, he insisted that everyone ate ice cream from the early morning to the uh, late, <laughs> late evening. It's really, it's really. He insisted because we, <laughs> we have no space to keep it every day, every day. <laughs> You remember this, right? I did a real haircut. This one here. Ah. Uh, you were there for that, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember yes. yeah. I could cut you on occasion. She got very, very short, yes. Yeah, she she likes it short. <laughs> it's you with... It, uh, yes, there is not. Me with who? With, with the carrots. With some carrots. Do you remember? <laughs> I do remember those. They So one day I was on the top, and I'm like, God, it's getting hot in here. Ah, and I looked down. Uh huh. And ah, it was a sun. The sun was coming sun through. Spot. Yes, 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 yes. Uh -huh. Oh my God, it was painful. Uh -huh. And Sasha was there, so he, oh, he we started laughing, and he took the camera and got but, this picture. But you saw something is was melting. That was like the hottest thing. I tell you what, it's like a magnifying glass from space with no atmosphere to slow the sun down. <laughs> So one of the things I wanted to talk about with you is how much like a space mission this is. Because we have our crew. The day before launch, it was crazy. We, we were running around, there were so many things to do. Loading the spaceship, packing it. We had to uh, obviously plan the flight out. Uh -huh. We had to wire all this equipment in here. We had to order our food. The food's better here. There's just so many similarities. And then once you're in here, this is a beautiful business jet except there's eight people living here. Normally you don't live in an airplane. Normally you fly and then you're gone. And the amount of time is about the same. So we're 48 hours. It's a 33 orbit rendezvous. Mm -hmm. The time it takes an airplane to do one orbit is the time it takes a Soyuz to do 33 orbits. Yes, because it's only 90 minutes on orbit, yes. Yeah. And the satellites we have are geosynchronous, just like Tetris. Uh -huh. They're in Marsat, uh -huh. but they're like Tetris. And the space station... They provide communication right now, is? They do. That's uh -huh. where we're doing communication uh -huh. from. And we go... Ella, we're AOS now until tomorrow, until late tonight. Uh -huh. um, but your LOS over the poles, the station goes LOS because it flies out of the coverage of the satellite. Uh -huh. We went, it's like a shadow, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went LOS because we flew out of the satellite coverage. We went over the North Pole and South Pole. So it's a similar thing. We're flying out of satellite coverage. It's only we're going north and south, and the station went east and west. In a space flight, you're doing this, and the Earth rotates underneath you. But for us, we're flying with the Earth as it rotates. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So we're we're doing oh. a we're doing a, a, a corkscrew around oh, the planet, whereas the station is fixed and the Earth moves under it. Oh. 
So anyway, it's interesting to compare it. How's the Wi-Fi going, Yannicka? It's incredible. It's absolutely um, way above expectation. 2,000 and we're up again. Is that good or bad? But that is, that is, oh my goodness. That's... We're only supposed to get 1,000. Prior to the mission, I expected 1,000 kilobits per second as best case scenario. But we weren't getting 1,000 kilobits per second. All of a sudden, we're getting 2,000. It's climbing up to 3,000. I didn't even know satellites could do this. And everybody's on the so Wi-Fi. That's good. So if I knock everybody off of the Wi-Fi, I'm going to climb even higher, I'm sure. So the signal for the live stream goes from the cameras into the switchers. So I have four Apollo unit switchers, and then that goes out through the terminal on the tail of the aircraft gets beamed up to the satellite and then from the satellite down to the ground receiver. It then gets transcoded into cell tower signal out through a cell tower and then into the internet and then into the cloud. And then from the cloud, it gets distributed to the YouTube channel so people could see us. And all of that only had a delay of two seconds. It really wasn't much at all. What subjects did you study to become an astronaut? I studied math and also French. I had a very unusual background. And then I became a pilot. And then after, after being an F-16 pilot, I was a test pilot. So I had to learn a lot of aeronautics and engineering about airplanes. That's nice. Can I introduce you to you, uh, Vinati Pinocchio? The guy... Oh, yeah. This is the guy with the most days in space of any human being in the International Space Station for years. Um, Mr. Pinocchio, exactly how many days have you spent in space? Oh, many, many, many. Five flights. 879 days. I have to do 14,064 orbits. Uh, Almost two years and a half. About being in space or on this trip? Oh, living spacewalk outside of the space station. It was good, but it's a little scary. Great to speak to you guys. Okay, well, goodbye, guys. Goodbye. Bye. Have a nice, have a nice day. Bye. Have a nice trip. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, very nice. <laughs> As we started our flight across the Indian Ocean to Mauritius, I realized just how well the satellite connection had been this entire flight. We'd all been making phone calls left and right, and it got me thinking about the Apollo missions. Back in the day, there were no geosynchronous satellites, and there was no worldwide connectivity like today. It was telegrams, radio transmissions, Reuters, Associated Press, and whatever else the local news organizations could get their hands on. In Port Louis, Mauritius, we were introduced to Manda Boulel, one of the women responsible for the news broadcast of the Apollo 11 moon landing. She gave us some insight into how a country without connectivity handled major news events. The main studio was just there. This is where everything took place. There was all the equipment and the producer was there. I'm going back to 1969. So this, is, this was, as I, as I told you, the main studio where everything took place. We did all our production in that studio, so we simulated the launching of Apollo. Everybody had listened to the news in the morning, but they were all interested in knowing 
what was happening. So everything was put there because the Americans had given us models. And we did the whole, you know, the whole uh, sort of sh the shuttle going up and all that. Oh, okay. Just like it happened. In 72 feet per second. Fine, ask for me to see how I Two months it. before July, the American embassy had already sent us sort of short films about what was going to happen because they were all preparing for it. PDQ 602 up here. We were getting the news from Reuters, so we took extracts that we would put on because people were interested in going to space, but this was different because people were thinking of someone is going to go on the moon and walk on the moon, and that was something different. So the whole public's imagination was linked to that sort of space travel. But it was a real success because everybody sort of thought, ah, they, they have got the, you know, the real, the live program. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't live. <laughs> we only got the, the real films much later. At the time, in 1969, there was no satellite feeds and all that. So we had to rely on radio and reports. So you could sort of sense the public getting excited about it, knowing that somebody had gone and walked on the moon. That day was some, something different because in Mauritius, many people didn't have TV sets in their houses. So they went out to community centers and social centers to watch all this. We were part of one space, one world. It's been an amazing trip. Mostly, we stayed low, and because we had enough gas, we were able to go very fast. Difficult sector is coming up right now. Yeah. This is the uh, only one that we have any concerns over. There are no divert airfields in Antarctica in the winter. When we grew up, the space program inspired us, and we want kids in the future to be inspired also, which is a really appropriate thing for us to be celebrating. Because this next leg was so fuel critical, we had to reduce our weight as much as possible. And that meant leaving Gena behind in Mauritius. As we head south towards Antarctica, we will lose most communication and connection with our satellites. And the closer we get to the pole, our compasses won't be functioning properly. It made me think of Ferdinand Magellan, sailing into the unknown almost 500 years ago. He did that with several ships full of sailors. Five hundred years ago, Hernando de Magallanes sailed around this Strait of Mag Magellan with a couple people in just small ships going through the channels, trying to look in new horizons. 
Magellan initially set out to find a new trade route with the Spice Islands, and in the process, he made the world a much smaller place. I mean, in such a big mission, with no instrument, with no info at all, not even a map. For months, he and his crew blindly navigated the icy waters of South America, trying to find a passage westbound. That kind of enterprise, it was amazing. So it is so, it's so super well connected with this special moment with the, his ship going around the, the, the globe. And we are 500 years later doing another big expedition in a way which is doing this uh, fly around the globe, looking for new challenge for the human being. But there is one thing that's been in the back of our minds, and that's the fact that Magellan did not actually finish his circumnavigation. He died in the process. This is going to be a long leg from Mauritius to Punta Arenas and we will be watching every drop of fuel, making sure we don't waste any gas at all. We are uh, wishing you good luck as you head towards the South Pole. We will be celebrating by uh, eating ice creams tonight as you go over the South Pole. Control out. Seeing the sunset reminded us that we are flying into darkness in the Southern Hemisphere and that it will be nearly 20 hours before we see daylight again. There are no divert airfields in Antarctica in the midwinter. We're going in July, it's midwinter in the Southern Hemisphere. None of the ice landing runways that you have in the summer in Antarctica are open. With pretty much every flight plan that you get, you have a final destination, but you have also alternate routes. Right depending on if you run into an emergency scenario right. or whatever. Um, but this is already pre-planned in the flight plan that if something happens between these waypoints, you divert here. Right. If something happens here, you don't mind. Because you're always going to divert to the closest possible locations. Right. I was talking to Captain Jakob. I mean, there is an army of teams watching us every minute. They were just on the phone with Doha. They were updating the divert. Like, once you get past this point, you go to South Africa. Past this point, you go to the, or, you know, South America, uh, they were updating that like by the minute and they're oh. sending the messages. Uh, once you pass 70 South, your alternate will be Sierra, Charlie, Romeo, Mike. Once you pass the midpoint, there's, there's really no alternative. So you have to carry on over Antarctica and go to your destination. And we will have to pull back the power to achieve long range crews to make sure we can make land again at the other side of the earth. The extreme cold temperatures had a dramatic ripple effect. As we were crossing over the South Pole, our plan had been to cruise at 45,000 feet. But the temperature dropped to minus 83 degrees Celsius, below the limits of the jet, putting us in danger of cold soaking the aircraft and essentially turning our jet fuel into jello. Which would, of course, flame out the engines and turn us into a very expensive glider with eight very nervous crew members, slowly drifting down to the minus 55 degree icy Antarctic surface below. So now that we're, we're lower, we're boarding more gas on our way to Punta Arenas if we don't have enough gas to get there because the weather's often bad this time of year. Is there a closer airfield we can land at? We do have like a recovery route. Um, there is 
is in Antarctica, but it's still, I mean, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of miles. There is a military base from Chile, but then we have no clue what the condition of the runway is. So it would be a case of put the aircraft down once and leave it there. You know? No, no, no. If the plane lands in Antarctica, it's never going to take off again. Exactly. We are operating like pretty much on, on, on the limits here. You know? We are ready to copy the weather. QREX 011 Roger, Punta Arenas report. The minimum ceiling for landing in Punta Arenas is 370 feet. When we had left Mauritius, the latest weather update said that the clouds were holding steady at 1,000 feet. But as we turned the corner over the South Pole, we got a weather update letting us know that the ceiling was dropping rapidly, and it suddenly became a race to see who would get to the runway first, us or the clouds. You can't land if the weather is below minimums and having to divert to an alternate airfield would mean sacrificing the record and mission failure. Thankfully, the weather barely held at minimums just long enough to allow us to land as planned in Chile without diverting. We landed in Punta Arenas with only a small percentage of our initial fuel remaining. Descending to cruise at that lower altitude had cost us an extra thousand pounds of gas taking us to the absolute minimum needed for that ultra-long-range leg over Antarctica. It also cost us precious minutes off our lead. This refuel has to go off without a hitch. in Punta Arenas, Chile. The reason there's so much noise in the background is that to save two minutes, we're running one of the engines during the refuel. That, as I say, will cut a bit of time. The big thing for us is we're ahead of schedule right now, but there, I don't want to get excited until we touch down at the Kennedy Space Center. There are about a thousand things that could go wrong. They just shut the engine down. We've suddenly discovered that we've got to put oil in the engine on the last sector. We've been running so long that the engine needs some oil now. That was an unexpected delay in the ground stop here. It wasn't until after we were all back on the plane for takeoff that we all realized just how stinky Ben smelled. Do you, do you the lights off, Terry? Yes. What happened was, as he was changing the oil on both engines, he also noticed that the toilet pipes had burst. And he was all up in it. Coming over the Antarctic, uh, it got so cold. Apparently, the urine had frozen and had 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 popped out. So he came in the airplane smelling differently than he smelled before he went outside. It is the new fragrance from diesel <laughs> called Jet A Called <laughs> it was like, oh my god, I had to go get some ibuprofen. <laughs> I was getting a headache just he having it. He'd never seen the toilet servicing area frozen. First time ever that we've had a shitter frozen. I have some perfume for it. Hey, I'm going to be perfume. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget, you, uh, you're still going to get a big cut. <laughs> Magellan was the first person to go around the Earth 500 years ago. That's amazing that we're doing it 500 years later. Yeah. He probably yeah. saw that place yeah. as he went through. He probably stopped at the airport there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's where he refueled. <laughs> at this point in the trip, we were all exhausted. Right. Whose idea was this? Uh, 
of his mind he's after sleeping 14 brain. hours not yeah. sleeping properly, but, which is coffee together with tea bag. Oh, coffee and tea, tea at the same time. Yes, this yeah. goes with the mismatched shoes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> But we were also relieved that we had gotten through that long South Pole leg. And now, we were on the final stretch. Uh, we will do strength five, go ahead, man. Uh, at the moment, we have fuel of uh, 27950. Fuel tank temperature is minus nine up. All right, uh, thank you very much. We've copied that. Uh, we've seen you that you have uh, climbed, confirmed? Yeah, if I'm, uh, we, we were experiencing some, uh, some moderate turbulence at flight level. 360 and uh, it would have been necessary to slow down so we climbed flight level 380 to get out of that. All right, okay, and how is the speed doing uh, compared to 360? Okay, we lost we lost two knots. All right, okay. I, I just want to confirm, you mentioned earlier that there was a possibility of a shortcut that would, would have been able to knock off about four minutes. How are we going on that one? Colombia. That is correct in Colombia. Mission Control arranged a shortcut for us through Ecuador and Colombia. But it was not until later that we found out that this shortcut was directly over an active volcano. Usually aircraft aren't permitted to fly over active volcanoes due to the risk of volcanic ash getting into the engines, causing them to flame out. But Mission Control had gotten permission. Over position rollers request direct Kilo, India, Lima, Echo, Romeo. All right, I understand. Uh, over rollers to request direct to position killer. We'll see if we can achieve that. Thank you very much. It's already been arranged. You can go ahead with the plan. Fantastic. Much appreciated. Appreciate all the team's help there. Thank you very much. And then uh, enjoy the rest of the flight. Bye from RX Control. Much appreciated. RX 5 out. That's it. Good. All righty. So they were now we're in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Can you believe that? How was your sleep? Sleep was actually good. Very good. So we are about a thousand miles south of Florida. So we're just leaving South America and we're in over the Caribbean right now. And uh, we'll be in the Kennedy Space Center in two hours. What do you feel when you're in the space? Um, happy. Uh, I love floating really? and I love seeing that. That's a... Uh, no. That's one of the one of the best things. We're gonna be on the ground here soon, so I'm gonna go get ready to to film landing. Okay. So we'll talk to you guys later. Ciao. 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 <laughs> Sorex 11 here. A very good morning to you. Starfighter 1 will be launching as uh, one more orbit passes over position Zeus. Uh, stand by for a uh, Starfighter update. We have a Starfighter uh, F-104 supersonic jet which we've just launched from Cape Canaveral. It's going to intercept our aeroplane at around about 25,000 feet over West Palm Beach, which is just uh, south of the Cape, and he's going to film our aeroplane coming in. The Starfighter is the only aircraft that can keep up with us to film. Uh, and he's only going to be able to do that for a few minutes because of the speed. Uh, one more orbit, our Gulfstream G650ER is not going to slow down for anybody. Okay, so it's going to catch him up. Okay, we're not slowing down. Your 
Over the past 46 hours, more than 200 people from every continent on the planet have come together to take another step forward in mankind's journey of exploration. Our team circumnavigated the globe, pole to pole, 11% faster than had ever been done before. Bianca and Magdalena are probably the only two living females on the planet. On the shoulders of Magellan, Collins, Armstrong, and Aldrin, we've expanded the limits of what humans can do. One more orbit was our small step forward, shared in real time with a global audience, capable of reaching more people than ever before. Our mission ushered in a new era of environmentally responsible exploration, demonstrating that amazing things can be done 
while minimizing our impact on the planet. In an era of increasing global division, we showed that exploration is a uniting force, unlike anything else. 50 years ago, the entire world came together to cheer Apollo astronauts as they set foot on the moon for the first time. And our hope today is that the One More Orbit mission will unite people from around the world to dream about what is possible in our future together here on Earth. We may not know who we've inspired to take the next step forward, but we cannot wait to see what they accomplish. Please welcome the next inductees into the Guinness World Records book, Captain Hamish Harding. We thank Cadre Executive as a wonderful partner we had on this. Uh, they were superb in operations. I only found out this morning that they actually rooted us over an active volcano, which they just assessed was uh, safe that day, but it saved 10 minutes. So I'd like to now hand over to my uh, co-mission director, which is astronaut Terry Verts, Colonel Terry Verts in uh, Los Angeles. I'm standing here in front of Space Shuttle Endeavour. And the last time I was here, I was actually landing from space after my first mission on STS-130. Again, to living legends of aviation, Qatar executive, and the whole One More Orbit team, thank you very much. What an amazing honor. Poor Benjamin, all alone on the ramp. You, you know the keel beam? The keel beam on the aircraft? Yeah. You can't see it, but it holds everything together. <laughs> Isn't that the almost amazing bathroom view? This is pretty good. I could spend some quality time in here. Get Nervous? <laughs> ben, oh, wow. the nude beach. The nude beach is over there. <laughs> yeah. So here we are in the heart of London at the Inmarsat HQ. Inmarsat's the world's leading global mobility company. We provide connectivity via satellites to customers on ships and planes and on the ground all over the world. The flight route was very unique because there are many commercial airlines that circle the globe, but none of them they go over the Arctic and the Antarctic. So the constellation that was used for the One More Orbit was Global Express, which has the highest bandwidth. And we have a team of very trained specialist engineers that monitor the network. This is where we ensure that the aircraft received the optimum service and bandwidth that it was allocated. 